1977's The Dragon Lives Again, also known as The Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, has, over the years, become my tubular bells. It was the first review I ever made for the channel, the second review I'd ever written, and it's one of my favourite good-bad movies of all time. And of all the various uploads I've done covering this movie, none of them have ever really felt like I've done the film justice. In my opinion, at least. So, with our fifth anniversary celebrations coming to a close, and the end of the season imminently upon us, I figured now was probably as good a time as ever to try and have one last crack of the whip on doing this right. The film is one of the more bizarre examples of the Bruceploitation film genre, and that in itself is a pretty loaded statement given what the Bruceploitation genre represents. Bruce Lee died in 1973 at arguably the peak of his potential fame and influence. Enter the Dragon was released six days after his death, which massively boosted interest in the film, leading to a large rise in Western interest in the martial arts genre. And only enhancing the interest around his death, he was also in the process of filming what would go on to be Game of Death, which ended up being shelved for five years as a result. Between 1973 and 1980, Bruce Lee was held up as a shining example of how cool, awesome and impressive martial arts could be. And, naturally, when someone or something achieves global awareness, popularity or recognition, they'll almost certainly be hucksters and grifters waiting in the wings to try and seize on that popularity for a quick buck. And thus, the Bruceploitation genre was born. These were movies that would more often than not either portray a fan of Bruce Lee who looked very similar to him and often had names like Bruce Lai or Champion Lee, or quite often they would literally just cast somebody to play THE Bruce Lee as if he hadn't died, and I still find that a really weird part of this whole subgenre. Most films had original, if not slightly bland, plots. A decent chunk of these would pinch ideas from information leaked by the press about Game of Death, Let's be honest, they're a bit morally questionable. But because of how bizarre this entire situation is, it's hard to not be kind of mesmerised at just how low some people would sink to make a profit off a dead man's name. Especially when you consider that one of the earliest examples of the subgenre, Bruce Lee The Man The Myth, came out in 1976, only three years after his death, and extensively used footage from both of his funerals throughout. He was still warm. Anyway, The Dragon Lives Again was released towards the end of the subgenre's peak in Hong Kong in 1977, but it didn't make it over to the US until 1981, and it didn't reach Europe until the mid to late 80s, if it reached some parts of Europe at all. And by that time, the genre as a whole had moved on. There were newer faces like Jackie Chan and Godfrey Ho who were making big inroads in the genre in the West. Meaning that films like The Dragon Lives Again simply didn't land with as big a splash as it could have had had it been localised even a couple of years earlier than it ended up being. The film follows THE Bruce Lee and takes place almost immediately after his death. Depending on whether you go with the source material or the promotional material, Bruce has either been sent to hell or some kind of variation on purgatory. Personally, I prefer hell as I think the level of insincerity it takes to open a film with a caption that says, this film is dedicated to millions who love Bruce Lee, only to then tell the audience he went to hell, is both baffling and hilarious. This purga hell is ruled by the Emperor, also referred to as the King of the Underworld, who may or may not be some variation on Satan. Again, it's not made explicitly clear, IMDB lists him as Hades, so your guess is as good as mine. The Emperor and his court are cautiously musing about Lee's arrival in Hell, and they use this time to info dump. They explain that when a person dies, their appearance changes from what they look like on Earth. They also establish that Bruce was a serious ladies' man, and that the entire court's harem desperately want to bang him. Which may or may not have something to do with the fact that not only do they open the film by immediately telling the audience that Bruce is in Perga Hell, but they also do a knob gag by implying that his nunchucks under a sheet are in fact his erection. This is a very sincere and nuanced take on Bruce, I'm sure you'll agree. Anyway, the Emperor King decides that killing Lee is probably the best thing to do. How you kill someone who's already dead, I have no idea and two of the king's guards start smashing wooden boards over him. This is enough to just about wake Bruce up, and within minutes of being awake he starts threatening the king and the court with a damn good thrashing if they don't give him back his nunchucks and send him back to Earth. 
The king refuses, and instead threatens Lee by showing him a great totem which, when shaken by the king, generates seismic earthquakes throughout all of Perga Hell. The king basically threatens to level the place if Lee doesn't fall in line, and after returning his nunchucks, Bruce heads out to see what's going on in Perga Hell. After making his way into a local village... town... set? Bruce decides to stop by a restaurant to grab a bite to eat, because apparently hunger and thirst is still a problem in the afterlife, which... alright. And it's here that the film well and truly leaves the road and enters Wacky World, as while waiting for an order, Bruce is introduced to Popeye the Sailor Man and Kwai Chang Kane, who sort of merrily make inaudible mumblings at him. But this raises the attention of another famous media icon, Zatoichi the Blind Swordsman, who also stops at the restaurant to grab a bite to eat. Zatoichi goes to leave the restaurant, but stops by the door and shoots several chopsticks at Lee. Lee catches them in his nunchucks and Zatoichi flees. But it doesn't take long before he's back, and with him he's brought none other than James Bond, the man with no name from the good, the bad and the ugly, and an army of morph suit skeletons. It turns out that a cavalcade of characters from across the world of film and literature have teamed up to form a criminal organisation in Perga Hell that are running a racket on the village... town... set. And ultimately they hope to take over the entirety of Perga Hell. Joining these already mentioned fiends, we also have Father Merrin from The Exorcist, who for some reason is French, Don Corleone from The Godfather, erotic temptress Emmanuel, and Count Dracula alongside an army of skeletons and mummies. The team call Bruce out before a full-blown fight breaks out between Bruce and some of the skeleton army. However, seemingly completely at random, Bruce suddenly loses all his energy, gets beaten up very badly, and nearly passes out. The gang clear out of the restaurant, at which point a passing doctor and his… daughters? Assistants? I don't know. Basically they find Bruce, assess him and take him back to the doctor's office where they heal him up and, in a frankly astounding sequence, once Bruce has recovered he goes on to have a mini monologue about how he regrets sleeping with so many women and cheating on his partner, which just the balls of the scriptwriter to do that in a film that only came out four years after Lee's actual death. Jesus. Anyway, after healing up, Bruce leaves the doctor's office and heads to the gambling district in town, where he immediately wins every single game, announces that gambling is now outlawed, and splits all his winnings out amongst the patrons of the establishment, effectively introducing communism to Perga Hell. It's also here that Bruce meets another ally in the form of the one-armed swordsman. The owner of the gambling establishment isn't too happy that Bruce has just effectively ended his business and threatens vengeance on him, as the den is apparently owned by the king. Bruce laughs this off, and while leaving with Fang Kang, the pair are attacked in the street by security hired by the den. Bruce and Fang manage to take out the security, but this inspires Bruce to help the town out, and shortly after he starts training sessions, which the entire town, Popeye included, takes part in. These skills come in handy, as a couple of bumbling and corrupt police officers arrive in town looking to mess up the place, and everyone quickly shows them where to go when they start trying to get heavy handed. But this again raises the attention of Zatoichi, who this time decides to take Bruce on one on one. Naturally, because Bruce here is a border demigod, Zatoichi doesn't stand a chance, and his defeat is sent back to the gang who decide that enough is enough and that Bruce needs to be taken out of the picture. And after a brainstorming session and much consideration, they decide the easiest and quickest way to get rid of Bruce is to send Emmanuel over to shag him to death. I mean, I imagine there are worse ways to go. Emmanuel invites Bruce to the baddie's evil lair cave. The pair have a couple of drinks and Emmanuel tries it on and for some reason the entire baddie gang turn up to watch him get fucked to death. At which point Bruce finds it all a bit odd that a handful of random men from fiction have arrived to watch him bonk and immediately cottons on that Emmanuel was planning to boink him to death. The voyeurism being a bit too much, Bruce throws Emmanuel off him and starts to head out but the baddies ask him if he'll stop for a quick chat where they try to convince him to join their organisation. Bruce refuses and leaves. 
This causes the baddies to change tact, and now rather than trying to take Bruce out or recruit him, they're just going to go straight for the big prize and try to assassinate the King of Perga Hell. This is so that they can take his place as an organisation and be the ultimate big shots. And, after a brainstorming session and much consideration, they decide the easiest and quickest way to get rid of the king is to send Emmanuel over to shag him to death. I swear to god, that's their answer for everything. I mean, it's an effective plan, but so far it has a 100% fail rate. Anyway, they introduce the king to Emmanuel and the pair start having... Bouncy, bouncy. The next day, when Bruce heads into the village, he finds the villagers severely injured, the town on fire, and buildings and signs ripped down. It turns out the baddies have already started their takeover now that the king is otherwise occupied. Bruce finds evidence that the king is in imminent danger and heads to try and warn him, but is stopped by none other than Count Dracula. After dispatching the pesky count, Bruce makes it back to the Emperor's chambers and warns him that Emmanuel is trying to shag him to death. As if that weren't obvious. Anyway, after breaking up the rutting, Bruce fills the king in on the baddies' nefarious plans to take over Pergahel, and in response, the king promotes Bruce to the captain of his bodyguard team. So, Bruce does what he does best. He hires Popeye, Fang Kang, and Kwai Chang Kane to his new bodyguard team, and decides to head out to deal with the baddies once and for all. In an explosive finale that features mummies, the Popeye theme, and Bruce Lee being kicked up the arse, literally, Will the baddies succeed in taking over Perga Hell? Will Bruce be able to get back to Earth? And is the Emperor really to be trusted? All this and more will be answered if you check out The Dragon Lives Again. I first heard about this movie nearly 12 years ago when it was covered by Diamanda Hagen on her channel, and in the 12 years since I first set eyes on this film, I still can't really coherently describe my exact thoughts on the script for this thing. The gall of the scriptwriters to not only imply that Bruce Lee was in hell so close to him actually dying, but to then have fake Bruce admit regret at all the very salacious rumours and hearsay about his private life, which even today is somewhat speculative, really is beyond the pale. The plot's almost threadbare, literally the only key plot this film has going for it is Bruce Lee has to take out a group of fictional baddies in order to stop Perga Hell getting taken over by them, but that plot doesn't even start really until 40 minutes into this 91 minute feature. And the opening 40 minutes could be best summed up as, isn't Bruce Lee amazing? He's so humble and self-aware. He's just so dreamy. And look at the size of his huge cock. And even when the main plot does get going, it's padded to almost unreal levels with weird subplots like a near 10 minute scene where two of the Emperor's harem sneak over to Bruce's place, disguise themselves and attempt to seduce Bruce. Only for it to backfire and for the pair to end up covered in scales. But nothing is gained or lost from scenes like that and they're never referenced again. And better still, when it isn't introducing weird and random padded elements, the final 20 minutes of this movie is just one fight scene after another with little to no breaks, all set on a single soundstage or in a quarry. There's a three act structure here, barely, it's very thin on the ground. With the first act being Bruce going to Perga Hell, meeting his new friends, getting acquainted with the town, village, set and meeting the baddies, the second act being the baddies trying to shag Bruce to death, and the third act being the baddies trying to shag the king to death while Bruce tries to take them down. It's largely incoherent in its exact intentions. Bruce seems to have this strange ability to just make stuff happen. If he wants gambling banned, he says it, and then suddenly gambling is banned. If he wants to teach the village martial arts, it'll cut to suddenly the whole village learning martial arts. As such, there's never really any sense of peril or loss here. If Bruce didn't manage to defeat the baddies, nothing really would change apart from maybe there being a bit less money for everyone. Even his main drive to save the day, i.e. returning to Earth, is more often than not played down. In fact, he only mentions it two or three times across the entire runtime. And outside of that, it gets one mention by the baddies, who explain that when they were on Earth, they were the de facto leaders of their respective patches. Which, in many ways, is even more confusing, because that implies that Popeye and Dracula were real in this universe, and that they all kind of cohabited and lead gangs on the same planet. 
The pacing's up and down, with some scenes, particularly the fight sequences, running on for an eternity and other scenes that felt like they needed more time, and that's before I get to the dialogue, which is just extraordinary. I unfortunately haven't heard the original dub of this film, but the English localisation of this script is just hilariously bad. With my favourite line coming from none other than James Bond himself, who smugly and without irony proclaims, Brother, this guy fences himself a fighter. What a stupid jerk. He's gone too far. Which just... Perfection. There's no words that could better describe that. And lines like that are just muttered throughout this film and delivered with all the gusto that they so desperately need and deserve. The script was written by Wai Liang and Shek Ki. Wai has three writing credits and this was his second ever attempt at script writing. His last credit was in 1980 and since then, from what I can see, he hasn't been seen again since. Also on scripting duties was Shek Ki. Shek was a pseudonym for this film's director, Chi Lo, so maybe he wanted double credit for this absolute mess? I know I would. Either way, he only has two writing credits, both for films that Chi directed. The film was directed by Chi Lo, a somewhat heavy hitter in the martial arts scene with over 60 directing credits and 30 writing credits to his name in a career spanning nearly 45 years. He does have a credit listed in 2013, but given he was born in 1936, that would put him at approaching 80 years old at the time. Coupled with the fact that the gap between that credit and his last film was nearly 10 years, I'm going to call shenanigans on that one. He mainly seems to have worked in variations on the martial arts genre, so horror martial arts, thriller martial arts, sci-fi martial arts, all that good stuff. But he also did dabble in a spot of drama, action and thriller film work too. His last writing credit was in 2001, and again most of his credits seem to be for martial arts or similar styled works. He's more than cut his teeth in the industry and this film falls about halfway through his career. And on the direction front, I have a bit of a problem. You see, this film hasn't been very well represented on the home video front, more on that later. But in particular, a reoccurring issue is that it isn't presented as pan and scan, and it isn't presented as widescreen. Someone out there, in their infinite wisdom, decided that the only version of this film to see a public release would be full screen and cropped. That means that they literally took a widescreen print, zoomed it in so that it filled the screen and then chopped the sides of the print off to get it to 4.3. This means regularly that characters will be half on and half off the screen, text will be cropped off the screen and characters will just be talking to negative space because the person they were talking to was on the far left or far right of the frame and now they're cut off entirely. This is problematic when you're trying to judge the work of a director or cinematographer because you can't judge the composition of a shot based on what's presented here. There are tons of examples where, because of the crop, negative space is the framing. And that's incredibly frustrating, as from what I can see, this looks like a very colourful and very distinct picture. I know it's probably not going to be to everyone's taste, but it's clear here that Chi had a vision for how he wanted things to look and feel. Given the uniqueness of the script, what's been captured here borders on the experimental, and I really genuinely enjoyed the film's tone and vibe that it sets out to achieve. It's cheap and silly, but then the best films in my opinion often are. The only exception to this is the opening fighting montage, which for some reason is presented in widescreen 16.9 on some versions of this release. And it looks great, but it really did leave me wishing that the rest of the film was in widescreen so I could really truly appreciate the vision that the director was going for. The direction of the cast is great fun too. This film has a really consistent manic energy. Characters are regularly flying around the screen, fully utilising what small spaces they have. It's clear that the director must have worked quite closely with the core cast on this, because their personas are very carefully crafted and for more dramatic moments their movements are very clearly tracked. This film may look eccentric, weird and messy, but at least on the direction front, I can't really fault it. It's just a relatively decent attempt at realising a somewhat bizarre script, and I think it does the job about as well as the budget and time it was made in would allow. 
The same goes for the Cine as well, really. It's not great, certainly not noteworthy, but it's reasonable, sturdy, and just about gets the job done. There's a lot of locked off static shots throughout the film that I do feel probably could have benefited from pushing the boat out a bit more and really experimenting with things like low and high angle shots, Dutch angles and maybe even a few more tracking pieces, just something that would have helped the film match the pace of the cast and script. As it stands, and again I can't really be definitive on this because about a third of the frame is missing, it's just about alright. And that applies to pretty much the whole film, with the exception of the fight scenes, which are really pretty solid. Given that at least 30 to 40 minutes of this film is nothing but fight scenes, I think they've handled it really well. The entire cast use soft touch combat and the scenes are incredibly well coordinated. They use creative and in some cases comedic structures that really help to break up the monotony of I hit you, you hit me. They mask the soft contact shots really well from a cine standpoint and it feels relatively believable within its space. But it's not perfect, and I do have a few gripes. The chief one amongst them being that they can go on for bloody ages. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like a good fight scene as much as the next guy, but some of these scenes run on well past the point of appreciation. In many ways it helps me out because it gives me more time to jump on my phone and look up trivia and update my socials, but in real terms it can border on the interminable at times and was clearly only utilised to help push up the runtime. And those long fight scenes aren't helped by the fact that 75% of the fights in this film take place in a single location, which can cause a lot of the fight scenes to start feeling a bit samey. I don't know, maybe if they'd used different parts of the quarry or different locations entirely I probably wouldn't mind the length so much. But it looks like they basically just picked a corner of the quarry and shot all the fight scenes one after another without any care for set dressing. Put it this way, the three to four fights we do get that aren't quarry based were really welcome and are the ones that stick in my mind the most. But the quarry stuff, barring Dracula and the mummy fights, are totally homogenised in my mind. Performance wise, no one is taking this film seriously, and rightly so. Siu Lung Leung, known these days as Bruce Leung, is just amazing in this thing. The entire runtime he has this wonderfully arrogant and confident smirk on his face, and he really presents himself as a guy who literally owes no one anything and can do whatever he bloody well likes. It's almost cartoonish. And speaking of that, Eric Zhang as Popeye is a performance that has to be seen to be believed. He was a comedian and part of a troupe that specialised in bawdy and perverted humour, and here he really goes all in on gurning and comic strip level insanity. While his personal life has been a little bit questionable of late, here I think he's bloody funny and a total highlight of this film. The rest of the cast are all pretty much the same. They either play manic cartoon character-esque high energy sorts or they're cooler than thou and strung out. There's no middle ground. This is only enhanced further with the voice cast who, in a turn of events that will surprise absolutely no one, could not give a shit about this film and are either having a laugh with it or are just trying to collect a paycheck. It means we once again get a cast who do their best impressions of characters from the Carry On films or do the most generic and cartoonish American accents known to man. Honestly, the energy behind it is just so madcap I'm absolutely won over every time. I wouldn't even begin to comprehend someone actually trying to dub this film competently. All of this, when combined with the script, cine and direction, is a perfect storm of mixed textures that really is something I've never quite seen before or since. And finally, the soundtrack, which comes in two flavours, generic and stolen. Half the soundtrack steals songs from various movies and films, including the James Bond theme, music from Enter the Dragon and Fist of Fury, and in what must be one of the earliest known examples of this, the Carl Douglas disco hit Kung Fu Fighting even gets played. Seriously, how this film has avoided a lawsuit for all these years, I'll never know. The other half of the score was done by Frankie Chan, who's probably best known for having scored pretty much every Shaw Brothers film ever made alongside a considerable swathe of martial arts movies produced in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And here, it's inoffensive. 
Not his best works, but it fills in most of the silences and is utilised for the most part effectively in the correct scenes at the right times. But to be honest, a somewhat generic score is the least of this movie's problems. A total info dump on the release history of this film incoming, so maybe buckle up. The Dragon Lives Again was released in Hong Kong in 1977, and there it pretty much stayed until it was licensed for a US screening by Cineworld Pictures in 1981, where it would have been shown in drive-ins and theatres in widescreen. It was released on VHS in the US by Dragon Lady Productions and distributed by a company called Gourmet Video Collection, GVC for short. I can't find a formal release date for this version of the film, but it's a rental tape and let's assume it wasn't immediately rushed into video stores, so I'd probably hazard a guess that this came out in the States around 1985 or 1986. Shortly after the film came out in the US, it then received a release in the Netherlands, my guess would be around 1987 or 1988. And both of these versions of the film are the first to utilise the full screen crop version that we're stuck with today. What is interesting is that I've been able to speak to somebody who has a copy of the Netherlands release of this film, and from what I can see it looks like their version is ever so slightly zoomed out when compared to the other releases that this film has had. It's only slightly zoomed out, at most 5%, but I think it's amazing that the most complete version of this film to ever be released to the public never actually travelled further than the US and the Netherlands, honestly. As a result of the limited release of this film, bootlegs became incredibly prominent throughout the late 80s and early 90s. The most common VHS boot available featuring a cover showing the bathhouse scene from this film. and. Quality, as is the case with boots, varies drastically from release to release. Bootlegging was really the only way to see this film in the UK because the Netherlands tape was PAL dubbed meaning it would play on UK players. Supply was limited and finding a legit copy of this tape was very difficult. In fact, in the 12 years that I've been aware of this film, I've only ever seen two of these Netherlands copies go up for sale, and one of the US copies and they all went for frankly obscene money. The UK's first official release of this film came courtesy of Vengeance Video in 2005. It was slightly more cropped than the VHS releases, but was pretty much the tape release dumped on disc with no extra features. Hard cropped into 4.3, they crushed the 16.9 intro into 4.3 rather than letterbox it, and the whole film appeared to be sourced from a murky print that had been compressed to buggery just to fit on the disc. It wasn't unwatchable, but the artefacting was quite a problem in certain places. The film also cut the ending short by 2-3 seconds, meaning the music abruptly stops and then it dumps you back to the menu rather than ending as intended. This was the first copy of this that I owned, and it went out of print at the start of the 2010s and now frankly goes for silly money. I published my first review for The Dragon Lives Again in 2017, and at that point I'd have actively given a kidney for a Blu-ray release of this film. Well, my prayers were somewhat answered in 2019, when a then new startup company going by the name Gold Ninja Video decided to give this film the love and attention it so desperately deserved. Having spoken to Justin Duclo, the head honcho of Gold Ninja about this release, the intention was to present the film in the best possible way using what available resources they could find. Justin unfortunately couldn't tell me where he sourced this particular copy of the film from for the Blu-ray release, but I can tell you having seen multiple prints and copies of this film that this is easily the best this film has ever looked on a home video format. It's sharp, the colours pop, print damage is to a minimum, and unlike some releases, the widescreen intro is restored and it looks great. And apparently, other than some mild tweaking to the frame rates, it's been completely untouched from a restoration standpoint, which is just insane given how good it looks compared to prints I've seen floating around online. I do want to stress at this point that I don't want to oversell this release however. The PQ is great, but it still has flaws. A proper ground up restoration would almost certainly yield better results, but that kind of isn't the point of this release. The point was to present this film as it was when it was in bargain bins and video stores, only with more loving care aimed at contextualising it. And I absolutely can say that Gold Ninja have knocked it out of the park with this release. 
Not only do you have the nicest looking version of this that I've seen, you also get a raft of extras including a full feature commentary, an 80 minute trailer compilation of Bruceploitation Cinema, a featurette on where to start in Bruceploitation Cinema, and the disc itself comes loaded with not one, not two, but three bonus full feature films. 1980's Fist of Fear Touch of Death and two additional bonus features that are hidden on the disc that I won't spoil here. In short, this is probably the most definitive release of this film that we're likely to ever see. And this is the monkey's poor side of things really. The 2019 release was limited to 125 copies, which sold out very quickly and are not being reissued. They did a second run as a bundle in 2020 with another of their releases, again limited to 125 copies, again which sold out incredibly quickly with no reissues planned. And then finally in 2021 they gave backers of their Indiegogo campaign the chance to get an exclusive repress of the film as a non-limited edition contributor exclusive for 30 days only. I missed the first two pressings but you better believe I pounced on that Indiegogo campaign like a goddamn cougar. Justin has said that this is the final reissue, that it will never be repressed by them again. So if you do want a copy of this particular release, you're either going to have to skulk around eBay and hope a copy materialises, or you're going to be out of luck. And as an aside because I couldn't fit it anywhere else, film prints of this movie are apparently almost non-existent. From what information I could find on the topic, thanks to the Gold Ninja Blu-ray release, there are only two copies of this film on 35mm in existence in the US. One was on the verge of absolute collapse apparently, it was incredibly red and shown as part of a limited screening, and the other copy is owned by the American Genre Film Archive, the AGFA, who fully restored the picture and have screened it in full widescreen HD before now, but they haven't formally released it nor do they have any plans to apparently. And I totally understand why, because the moment they did that the cease and desist letters would come flying in at supersonic levels. But it still absolutely breaks my heart to think that such a bizarre and enjoyable movie is sat on a shelf somewhere fully restored and ready to go, but being completely unable to be released. I can only pray that one day that print sees the light of day again. The Dragon Lives Again is a film that, while far from perfect, will always hold a special place in my heart. There was a reason I chose it all those years ago to be the first review that landed on my channel. It's a totally bonkers experience that, if you're a fan of trash cinema and looking to get more involved in the martial arts genre, this is a great jumping on point. Just sit back, relax and let the stupid carry you through 90 minutes of absolute nonsense. In many ways, I hope this review finally draws a line under this film for me, as barring a widescreen release, which is still very near the top of my grail want lists, I probably won't need to talk about this movie again, which is a bit bittersweet for me. But hey, never say never, stranger things have happened. Till next time. <laughs>